I'm uh, very deeply delighted. Uh, it's a joy for me to introduce uh, Pastor Mike Beaumont. Um, we have been in friendship for more than <laughs> 10 years, uh, more than 10 years, and uh, it's a joy uh, for me to uh, be with him today, this evening. Uh, very briefly, I would like to introduce him. Uh, he has been ministering the Lord for uh, several years, several years. Um, uh, in India and also in abroad, in different parts of the world. Uh, he's a Bible teacher, lecturer, author, and uh, currently he's in uh, Teesside, which is near to Middlesbrough. He's uh, leading a uh, Bible uh, college with Tea Valley Church. Um, and, uh, you know, he has authored several books, and especially his specialization is uh, study Bible. Uh, several study Bibles uh, is uh, on his credit. Uh, which is uh, uh, simplified for, especially for new believers. And that is his passion. He has produced several uh, Bibles, which is available in Amazon. Uh, he has a very, very special connection with Kerala. He has been uh, coming to India for a long time, in Dehradun, in Bombay. And especially, uh, I got a privilege uh, to be um, in his team when he was leading the Bible College in Kotem for some time when pa Dr. Edi was uh, on his leave. Um, so their ministry in Kotem has uh, blessed not only the students, but also faculty members. And uh, we consider Pastor Mike and others from Oxford Community Churches as mentors for us. And uh, it has uh, deeply contributed for the spiritual atmosphere of the seminary in Kotem. And it's a blessing. Uh, I don't want you to take it too, too long. Uh, he's uh, worked 14 years in Manchester. 25 years in Oxford uh, with the Oxford Community Churches, and for the last four years, he's with the Tea Valley Church. Uh, he's in radio, he has uh, broadcasts through BBC, and uh, right now he's doing a program in UCB. Uh, if you tune to UCB, we can um, uh, get the program uh, from Pastor Mike. And this evening, it's a privilege and joy uh, to uh, uh, accept our invitation and to be with us, uh, to give a message to us. And Pastor, it's your time. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Pastor Sam Thomas. Uh, I'm trusting you can all hear me. Um, yes, yes, that's it, good. I saw a thumbs up and a wave, so that's good to know that the uh, wonders of the internet are working. As uh, Pastor says, we have been friends for many years now. Um, it's a long time since I've been able to go and visit the seminary in Kutayam, where I used to love going, uh, because 10 years ago, the Indian government decided it didn't want me in India anymore, uh, and decided to put me on the airplane that I had just got off and send me back home. And sadly, I've not been able to visit India since then. Um, but India is still very much in my heart, and Kerala is still very much in my heart. So when Pastor Sam asked if I would uh, share briefly uh, tonight, I thought that would be a really good opportunity to uh, reconnect with some Indian friends, old and new, and to sneak under the nose of the Indian government and uh, still to be able to share with brothers and sisters, uh, even if the Indian government uh, might not want me to. So I, I hope there's an amen to, to that there. Um, we were hearing in the worship time about what Christ did for us on the cross, how his sacrifice brought about a righteousness, not of our own, but that's solely to do with him and his death on the cross. And obviously we've been celebrating uh, uh, Easter fairly recently. We're in that period of the 40 days after Easter when Christ spent time teaching his disciples about the kingdom of God before he returned to his father. And what I felt I wanted to do with you tonight in this uh, short study time is to think about his return to the father. And the reason I got sparked off with that thought is because next Thursday, 
is Ascension Day in the church's calendar, the day when Jesus returned to the Father, having died on the cross, risen again, spent those 40 days with his disciples, he returned to his Father. And I'd like us to look at that tonight, to think about it, particularly in, in light of the situation that all of us are in at the moment, and to see how that might be relevant for us. So if you have your Bibles with you, let's read one of those accounts of the Ascension from Acts chapter 1 and verses 1 to 11. So Acts 1, 1 to 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? But he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside him. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? For this same Jesus, who was taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. Amen. Now, my wife um, Liz and I have had the privilege of, of traveling all over the world uh, over our lifetime. We have seen some wonderful sights, uh, especially in India. We've eaten some wonderful food, especially in India. We've met some wonderful people, especially in India. We've had some great experiences, especially, guess where? Yes, in India. Um, but you know what? Um, much as we have loved all that, there is always one thing that we miss when we travel. And that is our own bed. You cannot replace your own bed because there is no place like home and where you lay your head down and you belong, much as it's beautiful elsewhere. And you know what? That's the position that Jesus has come to by this point in his life. It is time for him to go home, mission accomplished. He has come, he's taught about the kingdom of God, he's died on the cross, yes, to give us that righteousness of God that we heard about earlier, He's risen from the dead and conquered sin and death and hell. But now, in this story, it's time to go home. Time to go back to Father. Time to go back to his rightful place. And very often, the ascension is it's something we can easily forget, particularly perhaps in Pentecostal traditions. We focus more on Pentecost than ascension. And yet, the ascension is so important. It's so important that the New Testament tells us about it twice. Luke tells us about it at the start of his second book, Acts. And he ends his first book, his gospel, with that story. So it clearly must be very important for Luke to tell us about the ascension twice. So what is the ascension all about? Three 
very simple things then an application that I hope will help you in your praying, not just tonight, but in the coming days. The ascension means, first of all, that Jesus is exalted. He's now back in his rightful place at his father's right hand, where he belongs, highly exalted over all things. And that's what Paul unpacks for us in that very well-known passage in Philippians chapter 2, which many of you will know, I'm sure. Philippians 2 from verse 6. We read this, that Jesus, being in very nature, God did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. There's the incarnation. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. There's his humiliation, his death for us. But then Paul goes on to say, therefore, God has highly exalted him to the highest place and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And I can't hear you, but I'm trusting there's an amen in your hearts as I read those words to you. The ascension is about Jesus being highly exalted. The one who came and lived and died and rose again is now exalted at the Father's right hand, in his rightful place. The second thing the ascension tells us is that Jesus is now ruling. He is ruling over all things. Why? Because at the cross, the Bible tells us that he conquered sin and death and hell and every enemy that can be named, and he now reigns. Amen? Paul unpacks that for us in another of his letters, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 to 23. I'm just reading these passages tonight. You can read them further and reflect on them further yourself. In Ephesians 1, verse 18 Paul says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power in us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. There's the ascension. Far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet. All things. Amen. And appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. What Paul is saying there is that despite how things might look here on earth at times, and at the moment they look pretty difficult for us, don't they? But despite how things might look, the ascension assures us that Jesus is now ruling over all things from heaven and through those things he is still working out his father's plan you know that's really the heart of the message of the book of revelation the apostle john was in a time of great turmoil and persecution and he couldn't understand what was going on and why things were going so wrong why were christians being persecuted he himself is in exile on the isle of patmos and it says he's calling out to God, saying, God, what is going on here? 
that he has this experience in the spirit of being taken up to heaven to look behind the scenes, to look and see what he cannot see with these eyes. And the first thing he sees as he is taken up into heaven is Jesus doing what? Seated on his throne. It's as if God is saying, John, fellow Christians, I know that you might be struggling at the moment. I know there might be lots of things going wrong, but I want you to remember that this, Jesus is still on his throne. Jesus is working all things out for his purpose. Don't lose sight of that, John. So the ascension speaks to us, first of all, of the fact that Jesus is exalted. Second, that Jesus is ruling. And third, that Jesus is preparing. That he's preparing to come back again one day. Those two angels say, why do you stand looking into heaven? This same Jesus whom you saw go into heaven will in like manner come back from heaven. Jesus is coming back again one day. Amen? None of us know when that time will be, but there is a certainty that he is coming. And when he comes, we shall be changed and we will become like him. And all these troubles and turmoils like the ones we are facing at this time of coronavirus pandemic, all of those things will be dealt with because Jesus is preparing to come back again one day. Glory. So the ascension, which we'll be celebrating next Thursday, but which I hope you can think about as you pray tonight, speaks to us of the fact that Jesus is exalted, Jesus is ruling, and Jesus is preparing to come back again. But, I want to put a big but in now. And the but is this. Just because Jesus is exalted and ruling and preparing to return, doesn't always mean that life will always go smoothly for us. As the book of Acts goes on to show us. Because after this glorious ascension of Jesus, and as you well know in chapter 2, the glorious outpouring of the Holy Spirit, what do we find in the book of Acts? We find two things. First, on the one hand, we find stories of incredible salvation and miracles and mission and generosity. Why? Because Jesus is on the throne. We find in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people saved on the first day of preaching. In Acts chapter 3, we find the healing of that crippled beggar at the temple. In Acts chapter 4, we find an incredible prayer meeting, an incredible generosity. In Acts chapter 5, we find incredible miracles. And so it continues through Acts, and so it continues to today, all because Jesus is on the throne. Amen? But there is something else that Acts shows us, and that is interspersed with these incredible stories of salvation and miracles interspersed with all this great stuff, we also find the apostles experiencing imprisonment, beatings, stonings, shipwrecks, martyrdom. Why? Same reason, because Jesus is on the throne. And because there are some people who hate the idea of Jesus being on the throne and who therefore do all they can to oppose the message, not just of the cross, but that he is on the throne and wants to be on the throne of their life. And so they oppose not just him, but his messengers. And it's that very opposition that proves he's on the throne. Otherwise, why would they oppose him? It's interesting that in Acts chapter 4, when Peter is released from jail for having healed that crippled beggar uh, at the temple, as he comes back, they have this fantastic prayer meeting. And one of the things that Peter prays 
is this, Acts chapter 4, verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard this, their voices raised together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and his anointed one. Peter was quoting there from Psalm 2, which is a messianic psalm, a psalm about the Lord's enthroned Messiah. And Peter sees there that people will oppose that enthroned Messiah. And he sees that that's what happened when he was thrown into jail. Friends, when people oppose us, when they oppose our message, that in itself is testimony to the fact that our Jesus is risen, ascended, and reigning. So in Acts, on the one hand, incredible salvation, miracles, mission. On the other hand, incredible opposition. And let me add one other thing. One of the other things we find in Acts is that things, how can I put it, go wrong in life. So we find the apostles having to face things like shipwrecks because of a storm, an earthquake when Paul is in prison in Philippi, a snake bite when Paul is on Malta. And it would be easy to think, well, these are what might be called natural disasters, natural events. If Jesus is on the throne, could he not have spared his servants from these things? Could he not spare us from the coronavirus pandemic? Well, the answer is yes, of course he could. But what is going on here with all these things, Paul talks about in another of his letters, Romans chapter 8, where he talks about creation heaving and, and groaning under human sin. Romans 8 verses 20 to 22, you can perhaps read later, I won't read it now to save time, but he talks about creation crying out under the weight of human sin, longing for that return of Jesus, when only at that point will it be returned. So when things like this happen, it's not that God hasn't given up on us. It's not that God is not in control. It's not that Christ is not on the throne. But these are all signs, coronavirus included, of a heaving and groaning world that is longing for that return of Christ. All of these things speak of a Christ who's exalted, ruling, and preparing to return. And because he is, the book of Acts shows us that we see both salvation and struggle. Or as I sum it up sometimes, we see the glory and the gory. Things don't always work out as we had hoped. But I want to end with this. Even when things don't work out as we had hoped, as we had planned. It's, these months have certainly not worked out as I had planned. In fact, just last week, I should have been in Israel leading a tour of pilgrims there. Cancelled. I had not planned that. My pension pot has shrunk considerably because the stock market has come down. I had certainly not planned that, but this I know. Coronavirus or no coronavirus, Jesus is still on the throne. And Paul tells us this, because Jesus is still on the throne, God is still working out a good plan that will further his kingdom. Do you believe that? As you were praying tonight, are you going to believe that he is still working out his plan because Christ is on the throne?
you know, we might be in lockdown at the moment and the devil might think he's got us all shut up. But actually the church is probably more active at the moment than ever it has been. There was a poll last week by a reputable polling organization reported in all the media that said that one in four people in the UK have watched an online service since lockdown. 25% of people have tuned in to watch a service. People who might not have come to our meetings, perhaps because they're too timid, but they've watched us online. And one third of those people are aged between 18 to 34. God is doing something in this nation and the nations of the world. Amen. So let me end with this passage. I want to read a very well-known passage from Romans chapter 8, which talks of how God is always working all things together for good. Why? Because Jesus is on the throne, exalted, ruling, reigning. And yes, there are stories of salvation and miracles and mission. And yes, there are times of struggle and things going wrong. But he's on the throne and he's working things out. Let's read from Romans chapter 8, verse 28. A well-known passage for most of you, I am sure. And I hope you'll be saying an amen in your hearts as we read these words. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. So what shall we say then in response to this? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, listen, is at the right hand of God in his ascended place and is also interceding for us. So who then shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, or coronavirus? For as it's written, for your sake, we are facing death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Stotterum. Ascension Day, coming up next Thursday, he is exalted, he's ruling, he's preparing to return. And that means glorious salvation and miracles and mission, but also mixed in with that act shows us at times opposition and things going wrong in life. But here's the great news. And a basis for you praying tonight that no matter what happens, because Jesus is exalted on the throne, God is working all things together for his good purpose. And for that, we praise him and we bless him. And I trust that this thought will help you in your praying tonight and in this coming week. God bless you all. Thank you, Pastor Mike.
for that profound thought. Most of the time we neglect the Ascension passage and uh, that was really fitting for the, the Christian calendar and also how very well connected with some of the things that we have been praying. It's, uh, we started with singing Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine, but uh, you brought to life some of these wonderful thoughts uh, that is already written in the word that we are not praying uh, with fear. We are not praying under panic, but we are praying with the confidence that Jesus is exalted Amen. and he is ruling, he is reigning, he is the king of kings, and also he's preparing. And uh, in the midst of that, we face a lot of things in the world. And as we are going into a time of prayer, uh, let's uh, pray with that confidence. And this evening, again, uh, we have seen a lot of good news that many of the pastors and uh, some of the brothers who have been suffering and those who were admitted in ITU have been released. They are improving. Their health is improving, which is a good news. And uh, even though we go through different, uh, different uh, difficulties, uh, everything worked together for good for those who love him. And uh, that is our conference. So this evening, let's also uh, draw near to the throne of grace, uh, uh, bringing our requests and uh, supplications before him with that confidence. Not with panic, not with fear, but with that, with that confidence that uh, this is, you know, as Peter says, uh, when you go through these fiery trials, do not uh, think that you know, something strange things are happening. Uh, because our Lord has gone through this and uh, he's uh, ruling, he's exalted. Thank you, Pastor Mike, for your precious time with us. And uh, so that was really a blessing for all of us. On behalf of the church, we would like to uh, give you our gratitude. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, God bless us. Thank you. It's been great Let's to be with you all. Prayer. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. God bless you and keep you Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face.